What's up, everyone? We have Matt Bonnard, previously played on the San Antonio Spurs over 12 years in the NBA. Have him on the podcast, also known as the Red Mamba. It's been a while since I did a podcast. Welcome, Matt. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Josh. So I just want to get right into it. Um, you know, now that you've been out of the league, been retired seven years, um, played with the Spurs for, I think, 11, off se- 11 seasons? Ten seasons. Ten seasons. Um, I kind of want to ask you, like, what are your biggest reflections and advice that you would give to your rookie self? Uh, I would probably, like, go back even further and tell my parents to wait ten years to give birth to me. (laughs) Uh, Just because, you know, I I missed out on NIL in college. Um, I missed out on the 2016 massive salary cap bump with the new TV deal. And I missed out when shooters just get paid. <laughs> I missed out on all that. I, I was too early to the game for the type of player I was being a kind of one of the OG stretch bigs. Yeah. It just goes to show how far the games evolved. You know, when I came in the league as a backup power forward, you just, you had to be an ogre. That's the best way I can put it. You had sure. to be like, 6'9", 260, and just go knock heads on every possession. There weren't a lot of guys that at that position that played out on the perimeter. It was like me, uh, Pat Garrity, Daniel Marshall, who was my vet in Toronto and really helped me figure out and carve out a role in the NBA as a stretch big. And then you had uh, Robert Horry, who was kind of a stretch big as well who I also got to learn from when I got to the Spurs. So I was really lucky early in my career to kind of learn from Daniel Marshall and Robert Horry. And the thing is, the thing I would tell my younger self, like definitely shoot way more. When I came in the league, the pace was a lot slower. The three point shot, the analytics behind the three point shot weren't, didn't really exist uh it it was more of the mindset like unless you're wide open keep working it for a higher percentage shot like if you can get that shot eight seconds into the shot clock then you can get it 20 seconds in the shot clock let's let's see if we can try to get, work the possession and get something even better through execution now it's not like that it's like if you have a crack and you're you're a shooter i'm doing air quotes you let that thing fly guys, guys shoot way more threes. Now the offenses are more efficient. It's faster pace. I I weighed like 245 when I played and I'm retired seven years and I weigh like 222. This is how, this is how much I'm supposed to weigh. I could have weighed my natural weight in today's NBA instead of having to lift, lift weights for an hour and a half every day and eat a bunch of protein powder and creatine. So just to survive. Um, So I just really feel like I kind of missed my time. Um, And I also think like uh, I I look at guys who kind of play like I do now, um, like Davis Bertans, uh, guys that just have kind of have flamethrowers and they come out and just fire away when they get in. And it looks so fun. (laughs) You would have shot even more threes. Exactly. Um, It made a lot more money. Yeah. You said uh, Robert Horry was your vet. Can you talk about, like, what did you, what were your biggest takeaways from having him as a vet? And you hear it a lot in the NBA, like, this guy's a vet and how important is his leadership. But what does that actually look like? Like, how did he guide you? What what were some things that he, advice he gave you? Or how does a vet impact a, a younger person on the court? Uh, you know, with with Rob and I'd say Don Danielle, too just how to find your spots on the court. The NBA is a paradox because in order, not all the time, but like 98% of the time, just to get a shot to play in the NBA, you have to dominate at whatever level you're at before, whether it's college, overseas, the G League, you got to be getting buckets. You got to stand out. Now you got your chance to go try to play in the NBA that's not your role. There's only, there's two, three guys on a team that kind of have that green light 
where you're allowed to just go out and create and hunt shots. Uh, everyone else, you got to figure out a role to support those guys. So it, it's weird. It's like you play one way before and then you get the NBA and you got to like play a completely different way in order to put a career together, unless you're one of the top, you know, 40, 50 guys in the league. But most guys, you got to figure out a role and you got to star in that role and you got to be consistent. The coach needs to know what he's getting out of you every single night for him to trust you and put you in the game when it counts on a nightly basis. And so with Danielle, just understanding, all right, this is where weak spots are on the opposing team's defenses where you can find shots. Same with Rob, you know, he he used to teach me like, if you get an offensive rebound, just dribble to the corner. Like you're just trying to clear the ball and no one will, guard you and you can just turn and shoot and you'll be open it's like a like an old men's league trick for example <laughs> a little rec league trick and then the other thing with with both of those guys is like composure you know mental keeping a mental even keel throughout the game uh understanding like for for guys like us we're recipients so we're kind of our game is going to be offensively is going to be dictated by the other team's defensive coverages if they're going to switch one through five, we're not going to get a lot of threes, right? Because they're just going to switch and stay glued to us. Uh, and if we get the ball, someone's going to be right on us. And back then, you wouldn't really shoot those unless you had to. Now, if you're taller than the guy and he's on you, you just let that thing fly. But yeah. back then, it wasn't like that. But then if the other team is is guarding pick and rolls, you know, if they're, if they're hard hedging, getting to roll and replace action – and before the big can recover to you, you're going to get open shots. Or if they're pushing it to the sideline, here's where you can get open shots in the pick and roll. And if other teams choose to guard pick and rolls like that, then your eyes light up and you're like, all right, I'm going to get like seven, eight threes tonight. And so just being able to keep it even keel where you might go like, you might play like 26 minutes and get like five shots. And you got to be focused uh, and shoot all five of those shots with confidence and you gotta you gotta make two or three of them you can't be like one for five oh for five one for five you're you're gonna stop playing it's a shot making league (laughs) and then when on the games where for whatever reason based on personnel or how they're guarding pick and rolls you get more shots then that's where you step up and and let that thing fly and you might score 20 points you know but you know just having that even keel mindset offensively to to search out those opportunities. And then on the other side, doing everything, all the little things, defensively hustling, being a great teammate, talking, communication, uh, you know, active in the community. Don't get in trouble off the court. Just being a professional, uh, getting your work in, staying ready, all that kind of stuff. Those guys, you know, Danielle and Robert Horry were ultimate professionals, which is why they had such long careers in the nba yeah i mean it's definitely like having an extra set of eyes on the bench and just someone who always has your back and just making sure like you're staying on top of stuff um kind of like that older brother you you may have not had (laughs) but in the league um you you talked about you're obviously very well known for your shooting shooting most of your career over 40 percent um can you tell us kind of when you you know you talked about every player who kind of comes into the NBA is usually like a standout player dropping 40, the best player in their state and stuff. When did you kind of transition from a, being a good shooter to elite great shooter? Um, and can you tell us more about that process? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I was always a good shooter for whatever reason. Eye hand coordination combined with just getting lucky with my mechanics as a kid. I think a lot of kids develop bad habits out of necessity because they're not strong enough to shoot the proper way and reach the basket. And then as they get older and strong enough to shoot the correct way, it's almost too late because they've already forged those bad habits and it's in their neurological pathways and they're going to release the ball wrong or they're going to have a hitch in their shot or whatever. And that's just like remnants from when they were were, uh, little and not strong enough to reach the hoop. So that's how they compensated and it sticks with them for whatever reason. I was lucky and didn't really have any huge bad habits like that, that would preclude me 
fundamentally, mechanically, from having a good shot once I was strong enough, combined with uh, really good eye hand coordination, I was always a, a good shooter. I, I my growing up in in the Boston area, in I was born in '80, so like my earliest basketball memories, like '86, '87, '88, it was like the heyday for the Celtics with Bird, McHale, Parrish, Ainge, Dennis Johnson, all those guys. So I, Bird was like my idol, who was a one of the best shooters in the history of the league. So anytime I'm in the at the park or in the driveway at the Boys and Girls Club or whatever, I'm Larry Bird. So if you're Larry Bird, what are you doing? You're shooting. So I, I was always wanting to be a great shooter so I could be like Larry Bird. So I think like all those factors put together – just made me always a good shooter. And then from there, it's, it's footwork, right? That's, that's the biggest thing that you try to teach kids is, you know, the proper footwork off the dribble, moving, trailing, coming off screens. And then you kind of use that as your foundation and you can build anything from that. And uh, I, we, we had this competition. I think it was national. It was called the Elk Soup Shoot. Mm -hmm. And all it was, you shot 25 free throws. And so you have like the, the city championship. So anyone in the city can sign up. So you got these old Elks club members there. I remember like these old dudes, uh, old, and they'd like rebound for you and, and keep the scores. And then if you won the city, you like went to the district. And then if you won the district, you went to the state. And then if you won the state, you went to New England. And I think if you win New England, there was like a national one. I never won New England. I came in second twice in New England. And that's when I like, that was like, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade when I was doing that. And I'm like, man, if I'm coming in second in all of New England, and this is like a pretty big competition back then, I can, I, I'm a good shooter, you know? And then I figured out it's way easier to just make shots outside than have to like, drive into people and get clubbed and try to finish, especially when you're playing against older, bigger guys. Like if you can just get to an open spot, catch and shoot before they can get to you, you can score on any level of competition. And so for me, it like tilted the wrong way. Like a, a lot of kids, you're like trying to get them to be good shooters and all they want to do is drive to the hoop <laughs> or post up. Yeah. You could, you couldn't even get me in the paint. All I want to do is find open spots shoot the basketball because that was the easiest way for me to score i had almost evolved my game backwards compared to most people no but i think you bring up a good uh important point that from from that age you were always looking for your shot and developing confidence in your shot like you were just like i'm open i'm letting it go so you being able to build a sensitivity to uh when the opportunities to shoot i think is a very valuable thing, especially if you did it over the course of maybe like 10 years or something like that in that fundamental age of when your game is growing. Um, well, you know, you, you listen to podcasts with JJ Redick and you hear Kyle Corver talk and other, you know, great shoot, shooters such as yourself and kind of everybody knows the baseline of um, importance of hard work, discipline, footwork, uh, shooting, you know, getting reps in, um, not skipping uh, on like those small things, but I guess like what were some of more of the unconventional things? I remember you telling me about uh, some stuff you did with Chip and some of the drills that you and I were talking about in Toronto. Um, can you share a little bit more about that side? Because I, I understand from a baseline, like you, ne you, you don't become great at anything without just relentless hard work and attention to detail. But past that, like what was the, the separating things or what – what was your mind space uh, when you created some of your own training? It was a lot of creating my own training. Growing up in New Hampshire, there, especially back in the 90s, like there was no trainers, individual instruction. Uh, you couldn't go on YouTube and look up workouts. It was like, we, you know, you had your high school season and that was mostly like, yeah, we had a very defensive minded coach. So it was a lot of drills for like defensive rotations, defensive positioning, being physical on defense. All, all the offense stuff was like running our offense, 
fundamentals of moving without the basketball. It wasn't like skill development really. Yeah. And then my AU coach, I lucked out. He he was the kind of the opposite. He wasn't the greatest as far as like coaching team concepts, but he was really good at getting you to develop your game individually. And a lot of that had to do with just like making you paranoid that someone else was always working harder than you. <laughs> like, I just remember like, I don't know, I'm playing like Nintendo or something. And, and then I can just hear his voice. Like there's some kid in Chicago working on his handle right now. And I'd like put down Mario three and like run outside and start doing dribbling drills. Cause I didn't want to get outworked or not make it because of that. And, uh, and he was good. He like taught us dribbling drills, which became part of my daily routine, which not a lot of people, like not a lot of kids would do that, especially back then. Like you wouldn't go to a gym and before you even shot a basketball, knock out like 10, 15 minutes of hard dribbling drills. Mm -hmm. Uh, he taught us how to like the importance of not going through the motions about intensity and taking yourself out of your comfort zone. If you want to get better. Uh, and then he taught us the skills to be a good offensive player and we, we'd work on them, but it was never like an, in, like, like you think of like individual training sessions now with like two, three kids, four kids, and you're, you're repping everything out. Mm -hmm. It was like within the context of a team practice, you might get like six reps and it was, it, it, it became incumbent. Like it was up to you to take what you learned in practice and go home and create your own drills and, and figure out how to, how to rep it out on your own self-motivated and master it. So I go like, once I got into high school, I, I go to the Y I had a part-time job working at a convenience store. So I had for five fifteen an hour. So I had some money and I could, I, I could go to the, I stopped going to the boys and girls club. Once I got into high school, I graduated to the YMCA. Let's go. And I, I go to the YMCA, like, and just live there and constantly work on my game. And I had some good friends who were like-minded, which I think is important for kids. Like if you surround yourself with other kids who like really love the game and are gym rats and want to be there and want to get better, not only do you push each other and get better, but you have a blast doing it. Like that's like socially for me, that was what was what I love to do. We'd go, we'd be at the Y for eight hours on a Saturday and have an absolute blast like i wouldn't want to be anywhere else and yeah we worked our butts off and everything but we had so much fun because i'm with like my best friends doing it and we have all these stories and memories from it and i think that gets missed a lot with kids nowadays when you just do self-direct or the workouts with the coaches um everybody wants to be on their phone looking at videos it, it was it was a way different scene like back in the 90s when i was in high school doing that so I, I would, I had this one drill I invented called three basket shooting. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's an, an incredible drill. So at the Y, you know, they have one court, the long way, like the main court, and then they had two courts sideways. Mm -hmm. So there's six hoops. So I, I figured out from an efficiency standpoint, you could shoot a three onto the main hoop. And, and you know, without defense, I'm shooting like 80, 90%. So I shoot a three, I make it. I catch it out of the rim, one bounce, one, two step right into my next shot on a side hoop, catch it out of the net, one, two step back on the main hoop, catch it out of the net, one, two step on the other side hoop, catch it out of the net main hoop and just keep cycling like that. And I, and my routine was 200 made threes every, every single day, never missed. And I had all my left, right, left foot, right foot makes all my right foot, left foot makes. Then I had one dribble pull up, left, right, one dribble pull up, right, left, and, and, and just keep plugging in different footwork and combinations out of that until I hit 200 every single day. And then the other thing I would do is like I'd, I'd bribe kids with like like a Mellow Yellow or a Dr. <laughs> Pepper. And, I, you know, I because I, they, they had vending machines and I take a dollar out and I'm like, listen, if you rebound for me for 100 shots. I'll, I'll give you this dollar. You can go get a soda. And they're like, they're like, Oh my God. Yeah. And so they'd rebound for me for a hundred shots. And so I could knock out like spot shooting or something. And then I'd give them the dollar and they'd be so happy. 
to rebound just for a dollar to, to uh, get a soda. And, and you just, uh, for me individually, I never worked out with anyone. It was always just like by myself at the Y or with friends at the Y. We'd make deals. All right, if you rebound for me for 50 shots, I'll rebound for you for 50 shots and shake on a deal. And then we do it, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I remember trying to convince my brother to come rebound me. I tried the same thing, but he'd rebound for like 20 shots and then he would just run back inside. I'd be like, dang it. <laughs> this is You're gonna not be getting a, paid for that. This is going to be a tough workout. Um, I think you brought up a good point. Uh, well, you have a younger brother, right, who played yeah. basketball, and then you mentioned Chris Brickley. Also, used to you guys used to spend a lot of time together. I'm assuming it was you three and maybe someone else in at the Y together. Um, you bring up a valuable point of that. Just spending the eight hours there, although like if you spend eight hours, how hard can you go for eight hours consistently? But it's the act of um, exploration, like having fun, like hey try this, try that. Is this going to work? Oh, let's play competitively out of this spot. There's just that, there's just that time to explore different things and kind of figure out what works for you. But like you said, that like-mindedness of getting after it and challenging each other to one up each other. I think that's like a huge missing component in today's training when you just have maybe a player working out with an individual trainer and it's a lot of uh, on air, you know, dribble moves that maybe Jason Tatum do. Let's like copy his moves today and shoot with no defense. Um, you're not getting that same environment. And back to what you were saying about your, your AAU coach, I thought was really unique was that he kind of taught you guys uh, skill within the context of the game instead of isolated. Is, is that what you meant by kind of like he would teach, he would have you guys train, um, to work on certain skills, like within the practice. Yeah, absolutely. It was, he would always explain why, right? Like, this is why you need to work on this move. Here's the situation in the game. And if you can learn this, this is how it helps you exploit the defense. And then you, you brought up a good point about like practicing with no defense. Like it seems like, you can fall into the trap of one or the other. Like I hear about kids where they do all these individual instruction workouts and never like, just go play, like go play. You got, you got to do, or you, you get the opposite. Kids just play games. They never practice. You need both. You need the mix. You need to, and, and you don't, you honestly, like you don't need a million AU games to do it like just find a park and play pickup and, and experiment with the skills you're working on, on your own, you know, like uh, the nineties, the Iverson killer crossover. It's like, all right, Hey, we're going to work on the Iverson killer crossover with no defense. And then once we think we got it, let's get it. Let's start a pickup game. And now I'm going to work on it in the pickup game against live defense and figure it out. You know, it's one thing to do it with no one guarding you. It's another thing to figure it out with someone trying to steal the basketball and stay in front of you and body you when you make the crossover. And, and that's how you learn not just the moves, but how to apply them within a game. You can't have one without the other. It, or otherwise, what's the point? And, th and then the other thing, like, all right, you go to the Y for eight hours. You can't just work out hard for eight hours. It's <laughs> physically no. impossible yeah. for a human being. But, like you have to be purposeful when you do. So like, you know, I go to the Y for eight hours. All right, I'm going to do 20 minutes of hard dribbling drills. Then I'm going to chill and I'm going to joke around with my friends and we're, and we're going to do our Kareem impressions or something. Maybe we play a wiffle ball game. All right, now we're going to work on our shooting. But when we work on our shooting, we're locked in and we're working at game speed, trying to get better. We're going to do 30, 30, 40 minutes of all these shots and knock out all our shooting. Then we're going to chill and we're going to goof off and throw basketballs and footballs at each other or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, you got you to gotta have that balance and understand. But when you do work, you got to be able to lock in and, and do it with intensity. Um, uh, that Otherwise, I mean, A, it's impossible to do it for eight hours. Or on the flip side, you never do lock in. You're never going to get better. Yeah, it's like such a crucial point that I don't think kids understand today is that intentionality that you were talking about is that 500 reps doesn't mean anything. Well, it doesn't mean anything if for 350, 
your mind was elsewhere or you weren't really focused or locked in, I'd much rather have 200 reps, full intention, your full attention on what's going on, you're totally locked in. That to me is way more valuable than, I think people put love to assign value as to how, how the quantity of their workout. People love saying like, oh, I used to shoot a thousand shots every, I a thousand makes, a thousand makes. Well, you know, everybody who's trying to make it to the league is doing, like nobody makes it to the league shooting 50 shots a day. Nobody, I don't, I, I don't think, right. maybe, maybe there's someone who could share the story, but you know, you gotta, like, that's like the bare, I, it's literally yeah. the bare minimum. I, I question a thousand shots a day, making a thousand shots a day. Like Ta- taking, taking, that's that. so hard. I like, I think the highest I, I could get up to was like make like 500 and like 500 is exhausting. Being, and I was a psychotic uh, work ethic. Like I lived, breathed basketball, brought my basketball everywhere, practically slept with my basketball. And I never even came close to a thousand shots a day. So I, I, I'm sure there's people out there that have achieved this, but I question the people that are like, I'm, I made a thousand shots a day for the whole summer. I, I, I need some proof of that. That's I'm, all I'm I'm, say. Listen, I'm just quoting slam magazine. When I was a kid, I was reading about Jason Terry, really? Jason Terry. When, when he, he transformed his shot. I think when he was in Atlanta, he said it Gilbert arenas on his podcast was saying he was shooting he was working out with some Navy SEAL who made him shoot a thousand threes per spot. I mean, of course, like, is it one workout? Yeah, I could believe one workout, but like you said, doing even summer. doing 500 yeah, makes, come on. if you're shooting at a high percentage is, is exhausting. You know, like I think at the fastest, maybe an hour, it depends what kind of shots. If you're just doing catch and shoot. Yeah. I can, that's, that's not really hard, but I'm saying like, if you're doing different footworks, you're coming off of dribble handoffs, pin downs, uh, flares, like that kind of stuff. Like, dude, 500 is <laughs> like, yeah, you're not working I mean, out for even, a while. Even catch and shoot. Like, like we, when I was on the Spurs, we had the gun and I used to come in at every night and I usually do, I'd stick to my 200 makes, you know? Um, but sometimes if I was in like a shooting slump or something, I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna do 500. And I would be exhausted and I'm an NBA player at this point. I mean, it's during the season I'd make, I'd make 500 and be like, man, if I had to make another 500, I don't even know if I would, could make it physically. And now it's like, Oh, well guys do this every day, the whole summer. There's, I'm just, I, I question that. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. We'll have I to, call, we'll have to investigate that. A little bit more. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to get a little bit more into your NBA career with the shooting stuff because, you know, I want to know where the Gronk drill came from and some of the other things. I've also asked some of my uh, audience for some questions. The The Bonner Challenge came up. I know we're not supposed to talk about the Bonner Challenge, but that came up. I figured now that you're retired, you might be able to talk about it. And then I want to talk about towards the end of the career, the, some of the stuff that you do with Chip. So um, starting off, Gronk drills and more funky stuff that, that you did. Yeah, well, all all of these drills have a lot to do with Chip England. Okay, that's um, here. We could start with, I guess, the Bonner Challenge. It's a drill I invented at the Concord YMCA in high school, and the the origin was that's how I would end a workout. So before I left the Y, you know how some people end on a make. Yeah, yeah, so shot. Um, I had two ways. One, uh. I would get the net stuck on every hoop before I walked out of the gym. (laughs) So whoever walked in next, every net would be stuck, which I used to get a kick out of. And then eventually I started doing the Bonner challenge, which is right-handed layup, left-handed layup, foul shot, top of the key, top of the key, NBA three, and then coming back, top of the key, NBA three, top of the key, foul shot, left-handed layup, right-handed layup. And you got to do it all in a row. If you miss at any point, you start over. And and so I would just stay until I until I did it. Chip, we always joke about this. Like uh, I don't think he, he might not be joking. Like Shark <laughs> Tank, you know, like you go yeah. on Shark Tank, and, and the sh- the shark kind of takes you under their wing for a percentage. Yeah, yeah. So he claims like like Shark Tank percentages, he deserves like eight percent of the Bonner Challenge. <laughs> 
because he took it and, and tweaked it and turned it into, all right, you, you get one crack at it per day and it has to be your first shots of the day. So before you shoot a basketball, you go out on the court and you get one attempt at the Bonner challenge and you either, you either complete it or you don't. And if you complete it, you get a point in the standings. Oh, it's standings. Okay. It's for the year. Yeah, it, for the year. And if you don't, you don't. And it's hard. Like, like you might, some guys might get like two the whole year. We had this guy, uh, Dutch, Dutch Gately, who's uh, an assistant with the Sacramento Kings. Now it took him like five years to complete it for the first time. Uh, and, and I remember when he did, there was like a huge dog pile and everybody, I'm surprised we were spraying champagne. He finally did it. Uh, but, but it like, it, it preys on the psychology of basketball players, especially guys that make it to the NBA because they're so routine, uh, driven, oriented, and they love challenges and they're superstitious. It's just a drill. Like once you start doing it, it just you, you're going to do it the rest of your life because it takes like 10 seconds. It's fun it's really hard to do. So you like, you feel amazing when you complete it. And, uh, and now it's like spread throughout. There's like people all over the league that are doing it because of all those reasons I just described. And so, yeah, it chip made it like more fun. We brought like a wrestling component. Um, we had like a championship belt. We do like double, double points. If you complete it on your birthday or if you, if you complete it, on the road at the, at your, the arena in the city you're from. And, uh, people like we had like a, like a council, like a, like a commission to like, for like rule changes and like <laughs> people get suspended for interfering with people. Like it became this, like it took this whole life of its own, which quite frankly, you need stuff like that in an NBA season. It's just such a long year, especially like in, this time of year, you know, January, February, March, the dog days of the NBA, you need stuff like that to keep it fun and spice it up. So this would be just like walking into a new arena. You guys get there first thing practice. It's like, all right, we're going yeah. right away. Cause it's first shot, right? Yeah. Before walkthrough, we we'd have uh, one rim dedicated for all, all the Bonner challenge participants. How many people were, yeah, were, were doing it? Uh, at the peak, maybe like 15 to 20. Cause we, it wouldn't just be players. It would be like the video guys, assistant coaches, everyone would get addicted to it. Like I said, it's just like psychologically, it's like just one of those things. Like once yeah. you start doing it, you just always do it. So who ended Everybody, up winning, yeah. winning the most? Um, I, I, I hate saying this. Um, <laughs> hopefully not too many people watch this podcast, but Chip England is, is the all time Bonner champion. Belt what holder. about player though? Player. Uh, I'm second. Okay. Obviously. Um, I don't know who's third. I lost track once the pandemic hit. Okay. So I don't know if like one of the new guys, young bucks might've crept up there, but, uh, we've had some random champions, uh, Nando DiColo. Mm -hmm. I don't remember him. He won it one year. Um, I think of who else. But did everyone at least get it? Like Tim Duncan, Parker, Ginobili. Did they all, did they all complete your challenge? Tim Tony Amato did not participate. Oh. Was, <laughs> Tim Cold Tony Amato did not participate. Uh, Tim is like the most. We talk about NBA guys being routine driven. He had his routine. Was not going to deviate off it. Don't mess no with no matter me. what. Um, so he had his whole thing. Tony, uh, Tony was like a after practice workout guy. So didn't really do, do much before practice. We used to always getting treatment and stuff. And then Manu, Manu would do it once in a while, but like, just like, just to mess with people. Like he would wasn't they, like a consistent enough participant. Would they at least watch? Uh, yeah, they keep an eyeball down and kind of laugh along with all the shenanigans going on. <laughs> Cool. That that's I mean, it it's so important because as you know, shooting is not just the to become a good shooter, 
you obviously have to have the technical components and I obviously have worked very hard to get your shot to where it is. But that last element that takes you to the next tier is that mental ability, the psychological, being able to handle the psychological pressures, being able to, and, and maybe you can relate this back to your later workouts with Chip is sitting. I don't think people realize how hard it is to sit on the bench for three quarters after shoot around, after pre warm up or whatever, sit in the game for three quarters and then get subbed in three minutes into the fourth quarter and be like, you get three shots spaced out by X minutes and, and you're expected to shoot at a very high clip, like you said, otherwise you're not going to be, you're not going to get those minutes. So yeah. how did you kind of train for that? Yeah, it definitely got harder the older you got. Like when you're 35 and you've been sitting there and you got to come out, knees all creaky, be ready to go. Um, Bonner challenge was one way of doing that because it's the first shots of the day and it puts a little mm -hmm. pressure on yourself and you're probably not a hundred percent warmed up or anything. We used to do this other drill where we'd sit on, on like two chairs out of bounds at half court and just chat, have small talk, me and Chip for, you know, five minutes. And then Will Hardy or one of the video guys would, would come up and be like, Matt, you're in. And that immediately I had to jump up, uh, pretend like I'm checking in the game, walk, walk to the lift position. And we'd run angle or, or, or high pick and roll angle for Manu or high pick and roll for Tony. And they'd come off and whip it to me. And I had, and they'd set the game, they'd set the game clock to like 12 seconds. And I had to catch it and get one shot at the buzzer with someone closing out at me, flying at me as hard as they possibly could. And I had to make it because that's what my role would often be in the game. And that was the whole workout. One shot, make or miss. The whole we workout. It, great. Yeah, we won the game. Go to the locker room, treatment, whatever. I miss. Ah, you know, miss, uh, lost the game. Eat emotional, even keel. We'll get them next time. Shooter's mentality to the locker room for treatments. That was the whole workout. We do that once in a while. You mentioned uh, I had these two other shooting drills that were fun called Gronk and Cena. So the first one, Gronk, uh, a huge Patriots fan, especially when, when Gronk and Brady in, in their heyday. And it was like, you know, Gronk as a wide receiver or as a tight end, you know, you're blocking, you're blocking. And then he'd bounce off the block and turn and the ball would be right there in his hands from Brady. So we, we used applied that to catch and shoots. So I'd stand with my back to the basket or back to the passer and they'd pass it. And while the ball's in the air at their judgment, they'd yell Gronk. And then I had to whip around, locate the ball, catch it, and then get the shot off with someone closing out on me. And we do spot shooting, doing Gronks and, you know, end the workout. I got to make three at five spots or whatever. And, you know, it would be fun too. Cause sometimes they'd yell it too late turn around Boom. and hit me in the face or something. Um, or they'd, they'd yell Gronk and throw like a lollipop way up in the air. So I turn around expecting it to be right in my face and then ha I can't find it. And I'm looking everywhere where the hell where's the ball and catch it and do that. So that was a fun drill. Um, and then I can't remember uh, who invented Cena's. If it was Chip England or Will Hardy, or we have this other guy I'd work with, Brett Brillmeyer, who's with Orlando now. And Cena was like, uh, you know, John Cena, the wrestler, and his slogan was, you can't see me. So a Cena was catch and shoot, and one, possibly two video guys would run at me and have carte blanche, whatever they wanted to do to distract me. So they could, you know, both put their hands in my face. That's where it came from. Cause I wouldn't even be able to see the hoop and I'd have to catch, locate the rim hands and face, like one inch from my face, like Shane Battier used to do mm. but with like four hands and make the shot. They might chest slap me like a Ric Flair chest slap while I'm shooting. They might 
take one of the cones like a blowhorn and just scream in my face while I'm shooting. They might dive at my knees and roll like they're going to take my legs out. And I got to, no matter what the distraction is, I have to like focus, lock in and stay in my shot and make it. And that those were seen as, and we do those too to spice it up. Uh, no, that's, it's, I'm laughing because uh, the, <laughs> We would always try to do ways to mess up Jeremy too, like whether you do a nut shot and and the guy flinches or something like that, or you know I'd run at it with like two fingers at his eyes to be like this. Yep. Um, but then uh, recently I've been experimenting with uh, defenders closing out from different directions. So you got a guy coming from behind you or the side, so you see him closing out, yep. and then this guy's closing out like this. Uh, and then the the occlusion thing is like real tough, you know, like blocking the rim blocking the rim and not letting them see that. So it, I think what you're getting to is that at some point catch and shoot, I don't want to say it becomes too easy, but it doesn't provide any, it doesn't provide a, a novel stimulus or doesn't maybe pull you to the edge of your abilities, but the Gronk drill, the Cena drill, and I'm sure all the other things, it's really exploring that edge of, can you perform at your edge, but also can you perform when we need you to perform any time during the season. And I think people don't realize like, oh, that's awesome. You shot 80, 90% at your Y workout and with your trainer, but they're like, can you shoot your 40, 45% in game during the season and during playoffs? Yeah, it's funny you brought up those numbers because it does seem the correlation is divide by two. Like whatever yeah. you're shooting with no defense and a repetitive workout, divide it by two and that's, around what you're going to shoot in the game and that like with with when i talk to high school kids about shooting and i'll pull someone up like you know who's the best shooter in the camp and kid will raise his hand and i'll always ask the other kids i'm like is he is he telling the truth is he a good shooter because a lot of kids think they're good shooters but they're not and you know they'll all nod so i'll bring them up and we'll do like a no defense some repetitive shooting drills and he'll make 60 out of 100, you know, which is pretty good. But I'm like, that means in the game, you're, you're, only, you're probably shooting 30% from three. That's not very good. So, like, the best shooter in this whole camp is actually not a very good shooter uh, in the, at, when you get to the college NBA levels. Mm. Doesn't mean he, he can't get there. Like, he has good mechanics, but it just goes to show how much more work he has. And, and how much it takes, how much dedication it takes to be a great shooter, the physical stuff, the, the muscle memory, the mental side of it. It's, it's a really hard skill to master and it fluctuates. It has its ups and downs. The best shooters in the world go through slumps where they look like they're horrible shooters. Steph Curry has slumps. Steph Curry has games where he goes two for 14. It's just such a interesting study of the human brain and body and all the external factors that go into determining if you're going to have a successful shooting night or not. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, um, obviously for most of your career, well, I would say every season, but one you shot over 40%. Can you talk us about what you kind of learned about how to get out of your shooting slumps? I'm sure you had some throughout and I know, you mentioned that some nights you would, you know, get extra shots on the gun, but I would imagine that a lot of maybe the tweaks that you made weren't always mechanical. I'm sure your shot was still technically the same. So curious to hear about how you got yourself out of shooting ruts over the course of your career. You know, it's funny you bring up mechanical and if your shot's the same, we didn't have like the NOAA system. So mm -hmm. like, for anyone who doesn't know, like nowadays, there's all these tracking technologies for shooters to use on NBA teams. It tracks the basketball, the basketball hoop, the trajectory, the rotation, the arc, like all these measurements. So I wish we had that when I was going through a shooting slump because you do you can reach a point where you start questioning, like, did my shot unconsciously change? Like, is there something wrong with my shot physically that I have to tweak or is it just random chance mental thing and 
And uh, back then there was no way to know that. Now you could, like, if you're shooting with those technology things, you know you're shot. So now you have a slump and you, you get in the gym the next day and you're like, my shot's fine. Like that peace of mind to get you out of a slump, I think is, has, is very beneficial for a shooter. And, uh, I wish, I wish I could have tried that out, you know, from a, just a human curiosity standpoint, mm-hmm. been in a shooting slump, been, had that, uh, had that peace of mind to know like, no, my shot's fine. I just had a couple off nights and it just lets you relax. I think it would help you bust you out of your slump quicker. Having not had that for me, it was back to basics, form shooting, uh, shoot, uh, up close 12 footers, 15 footers where I know I'm going to make like 90 out of a hundred and just the visualization of seeing a lot of visualization stuff, seeing it go through the hoop, watching highlights of people making threes. It wouldn't even have to be my own highlights. Like if you just watch like a, like a Ray Allen, like a 10 minute Ray Allen video of him just making threes like that visualization, I think, has positive aspects to bump, bust you out of a slump. Because a lot of it's mental. Like you, you, even the greatest shooters in the world, I think, can like, I don't know if you lose confidence, but you start second guessing stuff. Mm-hmm. And just watch, seeing the ball go through the hoop, whether it's you shooting up closer fundamentals or watching videos, kind of reprograms your brain like, no, these are going in if that makes sense. And then another cool thing uh, Chip England would tell me, he'd he'd say a a game is a four-act play. I don't even know what a four-act play is. I never studied Shakespeare or if that even is a real thing. Okay. But it was kind of like, or maybe it was a two-act play. It was was something like, like, all right, you were 0 for 4 in the first half you're going to have more chances in the second half. You make, you, you, you go three for four, that's three for eight, that's 37 and a half percent. You're helping the team. Like you can even still miss another shot and make your next three and no one remembers. So it's kind of like a mental thing, like keep your head in the game. Don't let previous, it wasn't even previous shots. It was like previous rotations. Like you get a rotation as a role player and you play seven, eight minutes and you go 0 for 3. Your next rotation, you might go 3 for 3. You might go 4 for 6. Like you can't let that rotation affect your next rotation. And he was absolutely right. I can't even tell you how many times I'd be 1 for 5 in the first half and 4 for 5 in the second half and be 5 for 10 for the game. And everyone's like, oh, you lit it up. And if you told me that at halftime, be like, no chance. But if you look at it like that, it kind of takes the pressure off. So we just got cut off there, but I love that concept that you were sharing about uh, Chip and this this concept of a four act play where it doesn't matter what happens in the first quarter, second quarter. Like there's always the latter half of the game um, that where you can recover in terms of shooting. So thank you for sharing that about your shooting slump stuff. Can you speak more a little bit about the mental? side of shooting and maybe the self-talk that you experience on the bench and what that looks like? Yeah. I mean, you always hear about the shooter's mentality, like the next shot's going in no matter what. And that's easy to say in theory, but when you're a role player out there on the court with multiple hall of famers competing for a championship, it's, it becomes a little harder (laughs) Definitely uh, in practice. And uh, you know, I remember one time I had a game where I think I was like, oh, I missed like my first eight threes of the game. I was like, oh, for eight. Um, obviously a super rare occurrence for someone such as myself, <laughs> but, uh, I, I was like, oh, for eight. And I got a look on the ninth three and I kind of like hesitated and then like pump fake two hard dribbles and kicked it. Mm-hmm. And coach pop took me out of the game sat me next to him and told, you know, he's like, what's the best thing you do on the court offensively? And I'm like, shoot. And he's like, you think shooting when you're open helps this team win games? And I'm like, 
Yeah. And he's like, if you're ever open and you don't shoot the basketball again, I'm never playing you another minute and I'm trading you the next day. <laughs> and then he's like, all right, get back in there and check me back in the game. And so like just having a coach make it that clear to you, like takes all the thinking out of it. Yeah. So that makes the mental side a lot easier when you have a coach that has that kind of belief in your ability to shoot the basketball. Would you say like that almost completely eliminated the self chatter for you? Like when you were on the bench? It eliminated any doubt that I would shoot it when I was open. It was, you still had like, man, I'm just, I feel off tonight hmm. or I just missed my last four. I have no choice but to shoot this. Uh, I have no idea if it's going to go in. That's where we're going back to what Chip Chip England taught about the four act play. Mm. Like every time, every rotation you get is independent of the previous one. And also, like back then, it's that different now. Guys shoot like like it's nothing for someone to shoot ten threes in a game. I mean, back when I played, when I was getting like significant rotational minutes. It was very rare for someone to shoot 10 threes in a game, especially me. Like I might get like four or three or five. So it, it just felt like there was more pressure on each shot because you didn't get that many, but also you never knew when they were coming. Yeah. Like you might be over one or over two in the first half and then over four going into the fourth quarter. And you're kind of like, ah, oh, I'm having a stinker of a game. And then you got Chip England's voice, like it's a four act play and you might get four or five looks in the fourth quarter and hit three or four of them and swing a game. That That's what he's talking about. Yeah. That concept of just like forgetfulness, like just forgetting and letting go of the results and being like, okay, maybe I'm nervous. Maybe I am stinking it up, but whatever, on to the next play, on to the next shot. So that's super helpful. And yeah, going back to what you said about Coach Popovich's just unrelenting belief in your shooting. Um, can you maybe share something that you learned or took away uh, off the court from him and then anything else on the court um, during your time with the Spurs? I mean, there's a million things on the court. He's an incredible coach, uh, understands how to get the most out of his players, skill-wise, fundamental-wise, scheme-wise, all that kind of stuff, obviously, X's and O's, but also like mentally how to boil everything down and make it efficient for players to be able to execute to the highest ability they can on an individual basis, almost like part psychologist and every player is different and just understanding what buttons to push for each guy mm -hmm. while keeping like a general standard for everybody. And that's, that's like a, you always hear people talk about it. Like I'm not the first person to say it, but he, he treated everybody, held everybody to the same standard. You know, he, he'd go at Tony Parker or Tim Duncan or Manu in a film session. And then if you're a guy like me, role player, like, who am I to be like, oh, how dare you yell at me? You know, he's just yelling at Tim Duncan, <laughs> top, arguably top five player all time. So, uh, and that that's a credit to those guys and, and their leadership. It's a form of leadership to be able to take coaching and set that standard that everyone's going to be held to, to this standard. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, off the court, a million other things. He's Coach Pop's incredibly worldly, well-read, smart, curious, like loves learning about new thoughts, perspectives, um, opinions, all that kind of stuff. I, I would say the biggest thing, that I've kind of carried with me beyond basketball is keeping perspective, understanding an 82 game regular season plus playoffs, trying to win a championship. There's a lot of ups and downs and being able to keep an emotional, even keel through all of that. Um, the good times, the bad times, adversity, whatever is being thrown your way through the pressures of an NBA season on and off the court is really important to give yourself the best chance to not just win 
a championship and be successful professionally, but also like be happy while you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're on this like huge emotional roller coaster, roller coaster you can't like enjoy it. Yeah. And you're getting to do something really special that you worked really hard to get to. So you, you want to be able to enjoy it too. And so just kind of understanding perspective and like what we're doing has a lot of pressure, but it's, it's not life or death. We're really lucky and blessed to be in the position we're in being able to like have fun with it and like, like take what you do ser serious, but don't take yourself too serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after basketball, being able to just apply that, those kind of concepts uh, to your everyday life. And you always hear, you know, on social media, hashtag blessed. And I mean, it's super corny, in my opinion. I know I probably just alienated a bunch of people listening who are like, oh, I need to go do, uh, no. edit my Instagram post. <laughs> but but it's true, like just having having it's a form of understanding perspective if you're doing it the right way, if it's earnest. And, uh, you know, I, just when you're at really low times during the season, under his ability to like, you know, provide perspective by comparing what we're going through to like some real stuff that's going on in the world, hmm. you know, where, where, whether it's soldiers at war or natural disasters or, you know, stuff that's life or death, like real life stuff versus like us who lost three games in a row. It's like, come on, like, let's go back to work keep that emotional even keel right the ship. Yeah. I think that's such a challenging thing because you've dedicated your whole life to training, right? Like hours at the Y hours in college hours in pro sports. And this in a way has become your entire life. And when you're so consumed by that, sometimes it's hard to, to find that perspective, right? Cause like this is, this is your life and to just to be able to step out for a second, uh, you know, I think that transition from pro players to when they retire, you know, when you retire and you're 34 and you have, you know, the rest, the other half of your life, like, what does that look like? And I think that's great. That was great leadership on his part, um, being able to share that and always help you guys like grow and think about you guys after you guys finish the game. Yeah. It, and, you know, one of the big things with him is like getting over yourself. Uh, be yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself and show your personality. And to your, what you just said to that point, I think that's important because it is really hard to separate yourself from who you are to you, you the basketball player. Hmm. It just becomes such a massive part of your identity. But at the end of the day, it's what you do to play the game. It's you, you, you're so much more than that. But when like all your time was spent towards that to get to this place. And then once you get there, that's all anyone wants to talk to you about. It's all that seems to matter. You know, uh, that's what everybody wants to know about and hear about and talk about. And it's, you spend so much time doing it and it is part of you. Don't get me wrong. But once you retire and it's, ripped out from under you it's just gone you better have that perspective or you're going to be flailing big time yeah definitely well thank you for sharing that i don't want to take too much more of your time but i was hoping we could wrap this up with any funny stories you got any anything you want to share about your time in the spurs that we can uh lighten the conversation off of that perspective and, and end on yeah i mean i got a bunch of stuff but one thing i would like to say is um, you know, Kawhi Leonard, I don't know if you'll ever watch this Kawhi, <laughs> but you're with New Balance right now. And I carried the torch for New Balance in the league for like seven years. For like seven years, I was the only player in the NBA wearing New Balances. They weren't even sponsoring me. They like kind of sponsored me for a couple years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they stopped and were like, yeah, we're not doing basketball anymore, but I liked their basketball sneakers so much. I had the stockpile mm -hmm. and I just kept wearing them. I Nike, Adidas, Under Armour. Hey, 
hey, we want to give you shoes. I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm going to wear my New Balances for another five years. I'm wearing my New Balances. I'm I'm going to Kawhi's my teammate. You know, uh-huh. we're we're shooting around before practice. At the time, he's with Jumpman mm-hmm. Jordan, and he's clowning on my New Balances. And uh, you know, I'm like Kawhi, like. Don't knock it till you try these. I guarantee these are more comfortable than the, those Jordans you're wearing right now. And he's like, no, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> Lo and behold, eventually I ran out and I had to wear, I wore Adidas my last two years playing, uh, which I loved. Adidas was great, but like, it's because I ran out of New Balances. Um, but anyways, lo and behold, I retire a couple years later. Guess who signs with New Balance? You, Mr. <laughs> Kawhi Leonard, and I talked to you about, I chatted with you about it, and you told me you were right, Matt. They're really comfortable. So that's my story. I paved, I walked so Kawhi Leonard could run. <laughs> what, uh, oh, I'm going to have to send this to New Balance. What size shoe do you wear? I wear a 16. All Apparently, right. I'm not, I don't fit the image. I'm not cool enough for what they're going for marketing wise. Uh, but you know, may, you know. Listen, we all we all know what New Balance is, is what their bread and butter is. It's dads, it's men's mm-hmm. league, it's mowing the lawn. Mm-hmm. That's all me. So, at some point when they pivot back in that direction, I'll be sitting here waiting. All right, size sixteen. Of if if anyone was watching this, we're gonna get get some New Balances to Matt. Uh, really appreciate your time. This is great. Uh, and look forward to meeting you in person again and chatting again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Josh.